to kick us off with. Um, our show, Rendezvous, our project Rendezvous, opens next week. Um, our actors in the, in the middle of rehearsals, and we have two of them here today who are going to uh, perform a, an extract from one of the shows. Rendezvous, the Rendezvous project is five short plays that are written to celebrate the life and work of Julia Darling, who was uh, a writer in residence here at Live between 2001 and 2003. Um, the extract that we're going to see a bit of now is called um, Everything is Wondrous. It's written by uh, Amy Golding, and it's going to be performed by Phil Corbett and Zoe Lambert. And it tells the true story, in their own words, of the story of Jo Mill, who is a woman from Gateshead, who has Usher syndrome. She was born deaf, uh, and a couple of years ago, she elected to have a cochlear ear transplant. Uh, and she asked her very good friend, Tremaine Crossley, to make a mixtape for her, which would be the very first music that she would ever hear. And this remarkable story is told in this, um, in this play, which is part of our Rendezvous project, and here to, ex to, to perform an extract, as I say, from it, playing Joe and Tremaine, it's Phil and Zoe. <laughs> Do you want to talk about how we met? Um, well, I used to be dating one of his friends and I'm very good friends with his wife and well, we used to be part of like a close group of friends and probably known each other for about nearly 20 years. Right, that, but I'll be honest. <laughs> but one of the biggest regrets of my life is the fact that when I first met Joe, I was totally intimidated by her deafness. I couldn't, I couldn't get my head around it. I found it really uncomfortable. I knew I'd, I've been a lifelong socialist, so disability shouldn't be an issue for me, but I found it quite difficult because she, um, she does look away a lot, doesn't she? <laughs> so I found all of our friends were all right, but I yeah, particularly but found... Thing is, the thing is, it wasn't and I like, really regret that now. We didn't have a good relationship. Because we knew each other. Because I'm the deaf girl. But well, she was think, seeing my friend. Yeah. And we sort of... I didn't actually take the time to sit down and talk to her. Yeah, you went up I really wish I had. Yeah. Because she moved away to Sheffield for 12 years and we lost it. But it's, it's good that you're honest about it, coming yeah. to the truth, because people are uncomfortable. Um, the general public are uncomfortable about disability and deafness, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, but when she came back, um, we kind of made the effort. And she learned, well, because obviously she lip reads in Geordie and I'm swapping her bowels around. So, uh, <laughs> and I mean, I walk to work and she works to walk, don't you? <laughs> and that was a bit of an issue. Yeah, yeah. But we got there in the end. And uh, when she's got her hearing back, that's really, when you're going to go and have the operation, yeah. that's when we became a lot closer, wasn't it? Because... When you came back to live here, she was in Sheffield for a while. Yeah, and you got to know properly now, haven't you? Yeah. But even the Usher syndrome, um, even the Usher syndrome, because people describe it as like, you don't seem blind, but obviously we are blind, because obviously we have guide dogs, we have canes. I mean, I've only got a small one today because I've been holding on to his arm. But it'd be quite normal that I'd be sitting on a train and somebody would give up the seat for me. And then when I sit down, I start looking at my phone or reading the newspaper, and you can see the look on the face like that woman. Because we don't seem, therefore, we don't appear to be struggling with our sight. But obviously, we are blind because we only look through like this very small tunnel. And this whole thing would be fantastic for raising awareness. Because also, Tremaine didn't realise he must have thought I was quite ignorant. Yeah, because you can't see down here. Like, he might have been stood at the side of me. Yeah, and she never saw me. If you go shake her hand, she won't see it. You have to be right in this field of vision. No, uh, nobody realised that. No, but we kind of... No. When she moved back to, to Newcastle, she started getting in with the old... Well, because we were still being here, still being around her. Like, you just sort of slotted back in, Oh, yeah, you? yeah, yeah, it's great back in, yeah. Uh, picked up from years ago. That, like, the thing that first amazed me was she's such a good dancer. I mean, you can dance on one of the tables if you want. She's such a good dancer, you would not believe that person dancing can't hear. Yeah, yeah. Because you can feel it. I mean, if you've ever been to one of the deaf discos in Glastonbury, you know, if you take the headphones off, I know it looks quite strange, but you can feel it through your feet. You can hear the bass. And that's all she had to dance with. So that was astonishing to me that someone could dance so well without actually hearing it so yeah yeah but if people can't hear the music it's more like they're feeling the music a little bit yeah, yeah. so that's how we met really i would bore her to death about music and you know 
how important music was. Thank you. Thank you very much for Phil and Zoe. Um, Rendezvous, um, of which that is just one small part, uh, is uh, playing in the theatre downstairs from the 28th of May to the 6th of June. And as Phil said, there are tickets available in all parts. So, um, yeah, please come along. Um, next, we're going to uh, plunge into, I, I think they'll have to go back to rehearsals, but uh, yeah, it's right over time. Oh, right. Um, uh, yeah, go away. <laughs> 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 no, 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 Yes, uh, what we're going to look at now is uh, our, our flagship show in some ways for the, for the autumn. Um, it's a co-production with NTS, uh, and we're very excited about that new partnership. Uh, and we're going to see a little film, an interview with, um, with Lee Hall, the writer, and Vicky Featherston, the director. This is Our Ladies of Perpetual Sucker. refer to six girls who are the sopranos um, in the school choir. That is going to Edinburgh to play in a, a competition. Their aim is to lose the competition so they don't get put up in a hotel overnight as the prize that they get back in time for the last dance in the local nightclub. The story is based on uh, what well, I think is a brilliant novel by Alan Warner and it's about the day that these girls go and they can go mental um, and they get off their heads and get into loads of trouble. Um, and it's just, the, the novel is a riot. It's hilarious, but it's also, it's more than that. It's sort of, you get to know these characters and um, it, it's about a heartbreak and loss and, and uh, and that moment, that, 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 that it's a celebration of the moment of freedom and being young and the sudden realisation that these might be the best days of your life. I think we're forced, aren't we? Actually, more and more now, from a younger and younger age, um, the pressure's upon us to try and prove our maturity and our responsibility as much as we possibly can. Um, and I think what this is about, we're about that moment in our lives, and hopefully we've all been able to find it, where we had, we didn't have, we weren't responsible for anything. Uh, we could do whatever we wanted. We were entirely fearless. The world was our oyster, and it's a celebration of that moment. I read the novel. I think it came out in '97, and just thought it was brilliant. Um, and I always thought it would make a good show. But then I bumped into uh, Vicky, who I've known for 25 years, and um, uh, at a, a theatre do, and said. Um, you know, why don't you, when it, my, one of my favourite novels is a Scottish novel and she said, oh, it's one of ours too, it would be brilliant to, to, to make it. So, so we went on a quite long journey of, of obtaining the rights to do it and, um, and, and, and then of course that I started working up with Vicky, we went to Urban and researched it, and, but then when she left I thought the project might um, founder, but um, Laurie uh, has made it possible to carry on with it, to come back and to and to finish off what we started. So the, the way that we are adapting the book, which is an amazing book, and um, for a certain kind of group, a certain demographic, a really sort of beloved book um, by brilliant Alan Warner. Um, and what Lee and I have been doing it for a long time that we've been working on and developing it, one of the things was the kid came with the idea that actually it's a gig, because they're all into music and they're brilliant singers and they also love their own kind of pop music. So the style of this is a gig where they tell the story of their day to Edinburgh. It's in a, a rough and raw tradition of, of theatre, which I really associate with, with the best of, of, of Scottish popular theatre. Um, you know, it's really unafraid, it's really in your face, it's funny, it's moving and sentimental in the best way. And the girls go on a sort of 
wild roller coaster ride and my hope for the show is that we take the audience uh, with them. I think there's a kind of real vivacity and a dynamism around the girls and their relationship that is a real celebration of, of young people, of female power, of all of those things. Um, it's got amazing music. Uh, Martin Lowe is brilliant, who's doing the music with us, so um, I think it should feel like a real celebration of life and a memory of, of a moment that we all hope we had. Great. Well, um, I'm really pleased to say that uh, we have several important people from this production in the room today, and they're going to continue the conversation on stage here. So if I could invite up Lee Hall, who's the writer, uh, Marianne Maxwell, producer from National Theatre of Scotland, and our artistic director, Max Roberts. Uh, they're going to find out a bit more. Well, firstly, thanks ever so much for... Uh, coming up from London and coming down from Scotland. Pleasure. This is a really uh, exciting uh, partnership for us. It's the first time we, we've worked with the National Theatre of Scotland. And I was delighted to get a call from, from Neil to say, we're doing this, uh, th th this play that uh, Lee has adapted. It's a novel that Lee has adapted. And we wondered if you'd like to sort of uh, co-produce it with us. So it was a decision that didn't take too long to, to agree to. So I'm really pleased. Just a little bit of background. <clears throat> the show will uh, open, it will premiere at the Edinburgh Festival, the Travis Theatre, yeah. and it's going to do a very small tour of uh, Scotland, sure. and then it comes down here and plays at live from the 1st until the 28th of October. And um, let's maybe find out a little bit more about it. How did it, how did it come about? Well, I've worked at the National Theatre of Scotland since the very beginning, which was only 2006, so um, fairly recent in theatrical terms and for as long as I can remember The Sopranos has been talked about um, and you always obviously say no not that one the other one and uh, so it feels like a long time coming this and it's they can't tell you the excitement in the in the building because of the kind of uh, the wait for it has been it's just been there for a long time so it's brilliant and to have Vicky come back um, it's just right. And the partnership as well, I think what we do, we work in co-production um, co a lot and what we do best, we do in partnership and getting the right partner is uh, so important and I think we, we know it's the, it's the perfect partnership, you, yeah. can, just, you can just tell. That's so, great, that's great yeah. to hear. The woman you saw on the clip talking uh, with Lee is Vicky Featherstone. Now Vicky oh, yeah. used to be... That's right, the she's the, the founding artistic director of the National Theatre of Scotland and um, she left a few years ago. Um, uh, to go to the Royal Court, and now, but she's come back, this was always kind of her, her baby, if you like, and Laurie, our new artistic director, has programmed it, so she's come back to direct. Yeah. And so how have you been getting on, Lee? How's it, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I haven't it's seen good. a script yet, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going quite well. Um, I, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole way it's worked out is fantastic, because it's such, um, I think, in the tradition of the work that we've done together, mm -hmm. and lots of work that live theatre have done uh, it, um, uh, in the past, um, and so it's just it's it's fantastic because it's a perfect play for that space. Yeah. Um, uh, but the sort of it is a, it's all set over a day, and it's like there's six um, girls from this uh, Ladies of Perpetual Sucker school, um, and they go on this. And they're on the choir, and they go on this um, trip to a choir competition in um, Edinburgh, um, and they go absolutely mental. And it's at, at what, the, the the great thing about the book is got this fantastic um, dialogue uh, um, that's sort of very well, it's the uh, an urban di dialect, um, but it's 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 filthy. Um, <laughs> in, an, in an extraordinary way um, but what it's not gratuitous at all because it's about these girls who are in this place that's this quite small port um, and they're just desperate to sort of to, to be alive and to live and so uh, it, it's all all of their experience of their youth is crushed in uh, this, this one 24 hours and they go to this go to Edinburgh and they go absolutely mental and they, you know, they get off their heads, um, they sleep with absolutely inappropriate people, <laughs> um, they lose their clothes, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. 
Um, but um, at the core of it, what we've done the, the, it, with at the core of the novel is this um, this real pathos about their lives, with with contrasts about, about their energy and their um, bravery and their sort of hunger for life. But you do get a sort of sense of uh, of of, of the limitations of their existence. Because they come from quite a small village, don't yeah. they, on the coast, which is a submarine base, is it? But it is, yeah. And so, so they're desperate to get back from Edinburgh. They want to lose the competition and get back because they know the, the, the submariners will be in the disco. <laughs> so they're desperate to get back for the last dance so they can cut off for the sub submarine guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, but... Um, uh, um, uh, but the, the, the thing with bringing it into the theatre is um, the music, because we can use all this incredibly ethereal, beautiful choir music that they would have sung. And the cast that we've found are just the most amazing um, singers. Um, it's sort of, uh, you know, they're jaw-droppingly good. And we've created this other sort of aspect that's not really in the book, but one of the girls has a band um, and so there, there is augmenting the six uh, young women who will uh, act all the parts. And, and the, the other good thing about it is that the girls um, act all of the macho guys who hit on them throughout the day. And so, so you see the whole, their whole world through their perspective as they demonstrate what these... I mean, one of the things I was really interested when, when I heard about it is that it was going to be an all-woman cast. So we've got six actresses on stage as well as three musicians yeah uh, which is I don't know it's just an incredibly important statement because so much of our theatre and television and film culture is is, is dominated by a, a male presence to so to and I, and I, I suspect I, I can imagine that, that what these uh, performers are like because I know you've been going through the audition they will be brilliant singers and so to have six brilliant singers and performers banging out these, these, these songs, both ecclesiastical and pop. And, yeah, and, and the, sort, the, sort of, the, the sort of gag is that their band only does, they've got no records of their own, but one of the dads has got this sort of 70s record collection. So all the songs are from the, their versions, their sort of riot girl versions of um, ELO, mostly. <laughs> um, and so, so it's got, so, it's got a bit for everybody, a bit of a yellow and a bit of classical. Yeah, and I knew because Lee has such a, a fine following here in the northeast that I knew that our audiences would would be absolutely delighted to get a chance to see what he's what he's up with uh, with another with another company up in Scotland. And it's great to be working with uh, a Scottish company. I'm really looking forward to Edinburgh. It should be. Uh, oh, it's going to be great. Going to be it's a going to be really really good, and the tour is going to be brilliant. So this is right up the National Theatre Scotland's street. Right. Absolutely. Well, thanks ever so much. We want to keep it fairly brief, don't we, Jess? Because mm -hmm. we've got a lot to pack in. But that's that's fantastic. It's going to be a great show. So put it in your diaries. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, just to say that um, Marianne and Lee are available for interview uh, at the end uh, of uh, our presentation, uh, and that uh, the show itself starts on October the first and runs for three weeks three and a half weeks, so um, please come along. Um, now it's my pleasure to invite to the stage. Um, we, uh, uh, we had considerable success earlier in the year with um, a play called The Day of the Flymo, which is written by Paddy Campbell. Uh, and it was so successful, and it had quite a short run when we first introduced it, that we're bringing it back in November. So here to find out a little bit more about the show is the writer, Paddy Campbell, and also actresses Sophie Pitches and Tessney Mulroy. Stage. Yeah, um, I, I'm really delighted that we're, 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 we're able to bring this project back. Um, as you may be aware, uh, Paddy, uh, as a writer, has come all the way through the company. He uh, attended a, a course that Jess uh, runs called An Introduction to Playwright, and he started uh, writing uh, for the stage here and he started working with our youth theatre, with our education team, and eventually uh, his, his, his big 
success came with a, a play called Wet House that we were able to produce uh, in our birthday season. Uh, and we, it was a play that we actually programmed between a play by Lee Hall called Cooking with Elvis and Michael Chaplin, who also is here, called, called Tyne. And it seemed very appropriate that in our 40th year that we had a writer who we'd brought through the, 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 the company to sit alongside those two, two writers that have had so much success for us. And of course, Wet House had several lives and transferred to London and was published. And, and, and so it was really um, thrilling that, 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 that the next play uh, that we asked him to sort of create was a play that would also touch on some of the themes that Paddy was involved in, because Paddy, after graduating for a while, worked in the care industry, which was where the play Wet House came from. And, for the last few years, he's been working with kids in, 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 in care. And so the idea that Paul James, our uh, director of um, uh, education and youth theatre here, came up with was that he, he created a play that, that looked at the themes to do with, with kids in care. And it was another brilliant uh, concept, I, I think, that we were able to integrate some kids who come through our youth theatre as well as some professional actors. So what we, what we actually came up with with a show, with a show that was involved uh, actors from the youth theatre as well as professional actors presenting um, uh, the show. Um, can I ask um, Sophie, tell us a bit about um, how you got to be in the play and, 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 and what happened to, the, what was the rehearsal and performance experience like first time around? Okay, so um, I played the character of Clara and um, she was like this I guess she had a very different life to the main character, Liam, um, and I don't want to say she's kind of more upper class because that's a bit... Um, well, but well, she's, <laughs> she's a bit posher than me. But she's posher. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. and uh, she had issues with her dad and she met Liam. Um, but I found out about it through youth theatre and came here for the auditions and then we rehearsed from January until right up until the show in April um, and at first it was just me, Tesney and Liam, uh, Liam. Caleb, <laughs> um, it was us three and then uh, yeah Jill and AK came later on uh, about March probably yeah, in March. And you play, th th there's a little lad who plays the, the lead called Ca Caleb? Caleb. 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 Um, he plays Liam. He's the, the, the boy that the play sort of centres around. And you play his sister. Yeah, I play Becca, his sister. Yeah, and it's, there's mm -hmm. some quite emotional, hard-hitting, tough stuff in there, isn't there? Well, yeah. How did you feel about engaging with that sort of material? Well, to be honest, I haven't really experienced <laughs> most of the things in the play because like, there's some really awful situations that they have to go through but I loved getting to know the characters and stuff but it was quite I don't want to say hard but it was like quite emotional having to hear some of the stuff that the character had to go through there was a scene with a cat where I was, yeah it's the a cat, the cat scene. yeah it, it, is a, it is a tough scene anyone who's seen uh, any of Paddy's plays previously will know that he does write rather like Lee Hall who mentored him on the uh, original play he, he is capable of writing some pretty salty tough uh, dialogue I don't know where he, he gets it from but um, uh, tell, tell us a bit about how the play came about Paddy and, and, and what you know what experiences you drew on to create it um yeah, well, as you said, I worked in a residential children's home uh, for eight years in in Newcastle, and I was I was interested in writing about um, what happens just before the point when the, a kid would land on the doorstep with their social worker, um, and all the very various systems and procedures that kind of that start to happen when a family's deemed to be chaotic and not working. Um, and I think the, the thing when I really thought, yeah, this would, would make a good play, we used to get a lot of referral uh, notes from social workers about, about kids and what's ha going on in their families and all under various headings, like, you know, the kid's I identity and family life and health and all that but it was there it was, it was just like a line in one of these uh, documents and it wasn't anything 
really out of the ordinary or anything like that, but it, it's, it, it described the situation which is the very first scene in this play um, when there's a social worker knocking at the door and the, the mum's getting the kids to sort of hide below the window so you can't see them and it's, it, it, just when I read that, that just struck me as a, a great place to start a play and it, mm -hmm. it went from there really. Yeah. Um, what else are you writing at the minute, Paddy? Just by way of uh, uh, interest. <laughs> what, what, are you, what else are you up to? What's happened to you since you know since the, the success of, of both Flymo and Workhouse? Yeah. Um, well, I'm working on two plays for here. Uh, one of them's called The Blessed, which is it follows the story of an infamous loyalist terrorist who gets released under the Good Friday Agreement and Tim trying to adjust to the new sort of social and political order in Northern Ireland with, with not much success really. Um, and um, a play I'm working on is called Flag of Convenience, which um, looks at merchant shipping and the situations which arise, ships that are owned under flags of convenience, um, as happened in the time recently, can, easily be abandoned by their owners and the flag of convenience system allows unscrupulous shipping owners to uh, really take advantage of crews and avoid you know employment law and, and all that so a, a play based around that world and a crew in that situation i just spent a few days in liverpool with the the guy who's head of the union who fights for their rights doing spot checks on ships which was uh, quite fun um, and I'm working, I'm doing a thing for Channel 4, um, I've written the first episode of a TV series uh, called The Ballymuck Tumblers, which is about a, a 14 year old gymnast um, in Northern Ireland who's, whose dad tries to sort of steer him away from militant republicanism by shipping in a, a bizarre Russian gymnastics coach to his, <laughs> <laughs> to his yeah. gymnastics club that he yeah. Uh, that he runs, and I'm doing. I'm working on it. I've started interviewing for a verbatim piece uh, with kids who I've worked with in the past who've left the care system, and it's going to look at what that's like the system of being in care and then sort of being turfed out when you're 18 and how uh, how you know kids manage that, and also the people who are involved in the policies around around that. So. Well, yeah, that's, that's great. That's great to hear. Yeah. I mean, the, the reason I ask you, ask Paddy to talk about that is that that, 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 that our education team and our youth theatre and our new writing development programme, you'll notice that in this presentation gets gets equal uh, billing, if you like, with a play by Lee Hall in a co-production with the National Theatre of Scotland. And it's brilliant that people can come through this company and they can attend courses, they can do workshops, they can perform in youth theatre presentations. And then if they, if they want to, and if they have the talent and they have the chops, uh, they can actually uh, find themselves on our stage. And that, that kind of pathway of development is really important. It, it's pretty a quintessential sort of essence of what, what live theatre is about. So I'm really proud that we were able to sort of present this, this, this success story. And if you haven't seen David Flymo, you must come and see it. Uh, it's on Thursday the 12th to Saturday the 21st of November. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you very much to Sophie, uh, Tesney, uh, Paddy, and Max. Um, as Max has just mentioned, um, finding and nurturing creative talent is an essential part of our of our role here at Live, and a key part of that strand of work is the Live Lab strand, which um, creates work quite often in this space in the studio theatre. And here to tell us a little bit more about um, the Live Lab associate artists who are going to be with us for a year. Um, uh, this year are Matt Miller, Rowan McCabe, and Matilda Neal, and Anna Ryder. Uh, we have four artists this year, and three of them are collaborating on uh, a new production, um, which is going to happen in June. The fourth of them is, is directing shows in the Rendezvous project. And here to tell us a little bit about all of that program uh, is our creative producer, Graham Thompson. Hello everyone, um, 
Yeah, so it's just, just put them together. Um, so Live Lab is our artist development program that we run here. Uh, about, well, at the beginning of this year, we, um, we had a little relaunch and we kind of changed the way we look at it slightly. Um, but you know, we've moved on from that and now we're ready to present another six months of um, some exciting uh, programming and new work which will be seen here at Live Theatre first. Um, we have come up very shortly uh, two events which are kind of the staple of our programme, uh, our Scratch Night and our 10 Minutes 2. Um, Scratch Night is an opportunity for performers to come and test out, test bed a small extract of work that they've been working on with our audience and then gather some really important feedback at the end of it. Um, we have a Scratch Night this week actually on Thursday, which is uh, 21st. And that is featuring Rachel Mars, uh, Annie Siddons, and then local artist Stevie Ronnie with his piece. Uh, uh, um, I don't know what his piece is called actually. But I'll get <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and then our second event, which is Ten Minutes Two, is another regular event we do where writers, playwrights in this instance, get the opportunity to put together a ten-minute piece which responds to a specific theme, and the theme this time is Make a Memory. Uh, and we have six playwrights, normally we do five, but we threw, uh, we threw in a sixth one just for value for money. Um, and they are Chris Wilkins um, and Sharon Wilson, who are both alumni of our playwriting course here. Uh, then we have Jamie Morin, who is a former youth theatre member. And Ema Glocklin, who is making a return to our stage as a playwright, who some of you might remember uh, wrote a piece Good Timing, which was an Edinburgh show for us last year. And Matt Miller, who's one of our Live Love Associate Artists, who we'll get onto in a moment. Uh, and Dean Palter, who is, uh, who is based, well, he's from the North East and went to uh, London to study playwriting, and then luckily is coming back because he's quite a talent. Um, so what we'll move on to now, as I said, we did, this, we did this relaunch, and one of the new and exciting parts of the Live Lab programme is our Live Lab Associate Artists. Uh, as Jess mentioned, we have four. We've got Anna Ryder, who's currently uh, directing in the Rendezvous project and also going to be doing some projects for us at the back end of this year too. And sl slightly differently, we've been doing a lot of uh, spoken word um, events as part of the Live Lab programme, but we decided to kind of address that and focus on it in a kind of different way. Um, so we got three local spoken word and uh, poetry artists and invited them in to be associate artists of Live Lab and to come and create a piece, uh, a piece that had, that was spoken word and po poetic but the same had much more of a theatrical style and if I could just invite to the stage those three associate artists now, so Matt Miller, Matilda ne uh, Neil and Rome McKay. <laughs> You've been doing in the northeast, or, or not in the northeast, as uh, in Matt's uh, case, uh, just prior to um, getting involved with Live Lab. Um, so, kind of um, the sort of things that I've been involved in in the past um, were mostly based in poetry. Um, I'm part of the youth theatre here, so um, I've done quite a lot of performing as well. Um, and last year, I was involved in a competition called Poetry by Heart, um, which was all about kind of bringing poetry back as a, um, a form that is. Uh, a, a sonic form so people are hearing it rather than reading it on a page and I think that's really important in terms of spoken word and um, being able to get gain a much better understanding through hearing poems rather than just reading them and, and that's kind of uh, um, yeah I'm sort of coming from the same angle like I do performance poetry so I'm more interested in the sounds of poetry as opposed to the to the written shape of it um, I did a show last autumn called Northeast Rising and um, I took that around the northeast and um, it seemed to go pretty good, and I can't really think of anything else to say. So, um, <laughs> I um, grew up doing a lot of acting, writing in secret, went to Nottingham to study, um, and got involved in a poetry collective called the Mousy Poets, um, and started performing writing, um, and found that I quite liked doing that. Um, and then, Last year I was on the BBC New Voices scheme and was uh, preparing a bit of a work, work through that called Welcome to Writing um, and then uh, I think that's sort of how I got involved with, with Live wasn't it, it was sort of 
uh, got in, invited to do the um, the live lab uh, thing. So been living back in Newcastle now since uh, September, um, uh, making making this show with with these two. And so yeah, my my background is uh, plays and poetry. Do you just want to say that between three? Possibly just say a little bit about. Um, so you were brought together and you didn't really know each other that well at, at all. all no, no, no. <laughs> they never worked together before. So just want to tell uh, tell us a little bit about that process, about um, what it was like coming together and, and and starting to make work with people that you didn't really know. I was pleased that Rowan wasn't much taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Yeah. <laughs> Likewise, I was pleased that you were... I saw videos of you on YouTube and I was worried you'd be quite tall. And, uh, you weren't too tall, so that was good. No, it's, it's, been, um, it's been fun, it's been interesting. It's, uh, it's an odd one, because I've, I've made things like, not on the same scale, but I've made things like with mates before in collaboration, where it's, it's definitely different because you, you kind of already know the, the pages that you can have in common and get on this the same page straight away and start doing stuff and I guess the first month or two of this was finding finding that page I guess wasn't it yeah because it was left over yeah. to as well to you know the subject matter of the, the show yeah it was completely open it just make a show that's got um, yeah. poetry in it <laughs> so uh, the direction they headed on uh, was uh, so they're putting together this show which is based on uh, the reality TV show of sending people to Mars, um, which is an actual thing. Um, and I think, when is that the, the general plaza for a decade from now? Yeah. 29 we're taking off, isn't it? In our, in our version, yeah, we're talking 2029. I think the Mars One project, which is what it's based on, I'll say in 2027. That's what um, saying at the minute. Yeah, but it keeps getting pushed And just forward. for like a kind of context, so, so this, as I said, this is actually a real thing and it's based on kind of like a Big Brother style reality television show of an international effort to send people to Mars to live yeah, forever. Yeah. They're never coming back. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fully on board. I started out being very cynical about the whole thing and, and, um, and I think actually, why not? You're up for it. And so the show you're making, so it, it, yes, yeah, so it's dealing with that. You you kind of create some characters for yourself, and it's about that experience of, 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 of well, Nipping an experience which no one has really yeah. ever, well, well, obviously has never had, but um, an experience which is completely other to anything else mm. yeah. you can imagine. And trying to think about how that must feel when I guess like you're more isolated than anyone has ever been before in the history of, of humankind. You know, you're stuck in a very small box with two other people further away from Earth than yeah, anyone's ever been. In free fall towards a new planet, yeah. I mean, this, yeah, sorry. No, I was just because it started, like, we started thinking we might do something about finishing university and stuff, didn't we? And, and what that was like. And I think in the end, this is quite similar in some <laughs> <way>. <laughs> So the show is on uh, the 23rd and the 24th of June. It's called Red is the New Blue. And uh, Matilda is going to perform an extract, um, an early extract, because we're, we're still in the, the, the process of putting this together. So um, yeah, Matilda's going to perform an extract. That will be part of the show. OK. Um, this is called Lady Problems on Mars. <laughs> this trip has taken years to plan. Every possible event and consequence has been outlined, dramatised, scrutinised, every plan redefined, finalised, memorised. Yet for all my constructive research, I've one question left unanswered. Soon, I will be cosmically bound via a spaceship and a barren planet to two perfectly unsuitable males. <laughs> And the nature of our voyage means we've written off any potential legacies. So it's just going to be a huge inconvenience, isn't it? I mean, it will serve no future purpose. Do I have to go through it? Is there something they can do? Scientifically, because humans are intrinsically linked to their natural environment, our evolutionary development has led to our seasonal behaviours. 
emotional ties, cranial activity, even levels of athleticism correspond to lunar patterns. Mars doesn't have a moon. That might fuck things up. I mean, will I still want ice cream on the 14th? A hot water bottle around the 21st? Does anyone know the side effects of combining cabin fever, motion sickness and PMT? What if I do something terrible? I mean, like, drastically unforgivable. With these idiots, it's perfectly perceivable. I heard that emperor penguins mate for life. When they reach sexual maturity, they develop this ability to call, almost like a song, and their partners are determined based on their unique calls and the compatibility of their resonance. They display the widest variation in communication of all land animals by vocalising two frequency bands simultaneously. These calls are also instantaneously recognised by their offspring and copied for their own use. My mum used to say she, she knew when I was in danger or distress. Not in an overwhelming, clairvoyant vision way, more like an unsettling breeze between her toes, across the nape of her neck. Apparently I kicked like a bitch in the womb. I always thought I'd be lucky if I never suffered that. I mean, there's a reason why they call it labour, right? But I'm going to be living amongst the stars. And I don't mean in a Beverly Hills pool house. I mean, I will belong with the constellations. What couldn't I give up for that? Thank you. So yes, the show I say is Red is a New Blue and that is performed here in the studio on the 23rd and 24th of June. Um, going ahead to the end of the year, we have a couple of other uh, shows. Again, we have another 10 minutes to and another scratch night in November. And then we have a, another exciting thing, which is a new live lab event. Um, and bearing in mind, it is just the beginning of summer, but there is only 220 days left till Christmas. Um, so, uh, on the 21st of December, we will be having uh, the Live Lab Christmas Adventures, which will be a celebration of all things new and exciting with a festive flavour. So you'll be seeing uh, some more spoken words, some more theatre, some more comedy, some music. We'll be having a mini mixtape in there, and of course there will be a secret Santa, so make sure you all bring present. And that's it. Thank you. I don't wish to panic anybody, but you've only got six months to think about your secret centre. <laughs> um, also in the autumn, we have, um, we have a great programme of visiting theatre, and we have a couple of previews of shows that are coming this autumn. Uh, one of them, we're in, uh, proud to say that we're in association with, um, with uh, Dilly Arts and Open Clasp, and this is a preview of the show. It, we had one showing of it last year, and it's coming back this year, uh, and it's going to go to Edinburgh, which I'll talk about in a minute. But here's a preview of the show. Change is a, it's a really remarkable piece of theatre. Uh, as I say, they previewed here last year and it's coming back to do the full run at uh, Summer Hall for the Edinburgh Fringe uh, and then immediately after their run at Edinburgh it's coming here for a couple of nights. And Jill from Open Clasp is here. Uh, if you want to have a, a chat with her about any of the details about the show, I'm sure she'll be around for a while afterwards. 
Um, and just to return briefly to the realm of spoken word, in June we have uh, Simon Moll coming back to us. Um, he's got a show called No More Worries, and here's a little bit about uh, that particular project. Ever wanted to get away from it all? No More Worries is a spoken word road trip that happens live on stage. It's a story about Kieran. He's 27 and stuck in a dead end town. All he wants is to see the world. It's also a story about a bit. Paul is 50, on the road again, passing through, coasting, taking in one holiday snack at a time. No More Worries takes this mismatched couple on a quest for the perfect holiday moment through austerity Britain. But sometimes the past is the only thing that you can't leave now. Yeah, so please look out for No More Worries. It's here in June. Uh, and also have a look through the brochure at the other offerings that we have in the autumn. Grandad and the Machine, another spoken word uh, piece. Uh, the Bogus Woman and Mixtape. Um, as I mentioned, Key Change is going to be in Edinburgh and Live uh, is really um, excited to be associated with quite a few shows that are on uh, Edinburgh this year. Obviously, Our Ladies of Perpetual Soccer being one. Uh, and also The Soaking of Vera Shrimp uh, by Alison Carr, which is a Live Lab Bursary Award winner from last year. That's going to be playing at the Pleasance in the Attic, um, for, again, for the full run of the festival. Um, so please look out for that if you're in Edinburgh. And also look out for our brilliant young female uh, comedy troupe, uh, my Aunt Fanny, your Aunt Fanny? Your Aunt Fanny. Um, and Matilda, who you saw earlier on, is a member of that, that brilliant troupe. And here to tell us a little bit more about that, and the Summer Festival from the Youth Theatre, uh, it's Rachel Glover, our drama winner. Hello. Um, so every summer we uh, dedicate the building for two weeks to making work with and for young people. Um, and this summer is no different. So at the beginning of August, we will open with um, three device pieces, which um, will be made with the assistance of some um, local theatre makers who will come in and work with a group each to make uh, a piece of theatre over 10 days, which will be in response to a stimulus. And this year, that stimulus is going to be our new show, 11 Plus, which will be on on the Friday and Saturday. There's three opportunities to see that. And 11 Plus is um, a really exciting new piece, which has been made with a cast of young people who are 11 and 12. And it's a verbatim piece. And they've been interviewed both individually and in a group setting and have come up with some quite seriously funny stuff and um, there's some really heartwarming stories in there and there's some really fun stuff and uh, please do come and see it because it's going to be great and that is um, being curated by uh, Laura Lindo and Lee Martinson and like Jess said on Friday and Saturday we have your Aunt Fanny performing who will be uh, previewing their new show which they're taking to the Edinburgh Festival so they're going to be playing at the Edinburgh Festival from the 19th to the 29th of August at just the tonic, at the big fancy room, um, which is a five past ten slot. So if you've seen them before, they are now allowed to be slightly more risky than they have been <laughs> because it's five past ten in Edinburgh. So come and check that out as well. And then it all finishes on the Sunday night with an improvised film. Um, six young uh, members of the youth theatre will be working with Magic If, uh, Bev Fox and Ian McLaughlin, who you probably know from the Suggestibles, and they're going to be improvising a film. So when they get on set each day, they will be given a section of storyline, they're going to need to improvise all the lines that go around that. So I really can't say much more about that one. <laughs> We don't know anything yet. Um, so another exciting festival at the beginning of the summer. Please do come and check it out. And there will be a party at the end of it, as there always is. Haribo rings are plenty. Excellent. <laughs> well, well sponsored by Haribo. We should go to them for, for a bit of money, maybe. Um, well, the sweets are available. Of course. Uh, in addition, um, you'll see in our brochure that um, uh, 
Uh, there's a new programming strand for schools, which Live is uh, uh, bringing in in the autumn, and here to explain a little bit more about that, it's our Director of Participation and Engagement, Helen Moore. season we do have a new strand of work for school audiences and this links with our future plans uh, for, um, to work with school aged children in our new children's writing centre which is part of the live works development. So the piece that we're going to be doing for schools audiences is called What the Thunder Said and this is a theatre centre production written by Ed Harris and it will be here at live theatre um, on the 17th, 18th and 19th of June. The piece has been written and created especially for primary age school children aged 9 to 11 and it addresses a need that was shared by teachers. So teachers chatted with uh, members of staff at Theatre Centre to share their concerns that they found that lots of children these days were witnessing violent behaviour, um, be it through TV, through computer games in the media. And what those teachers were sharing was that they didn't feel that those young people had ways of dealing with what they were seeing. So Theatre Centre worked alongside children, teachers and psychologists to develop the content of this play and to develop the accompanying learning resources and the workshops. So each performance is followed by a participatory workshop and the teachers can take back with them um, learning resources to continue the work in the classroom. So we're really lucky that we've been able to um, secure funding from uh, Skipton Building Society Charitable Foundation who enabled us to deliver these performances and workshops for free for those primary schools. And we're just going to have a quick look. talk about um, was that um, work for audiences who have specific needs so live theatre we're committed to ensuring that theatre and our building can be enjoyed by everyone so in terms of um, work for audiences who have specific needs we have an, a company called Frozen Lights visiting, visiting us in October and that's the 15th and 16th of October we have The Forest by Frozen Light Theatre Company. And this is a piece of work that's been created for teenagers and adults with profound and multiple learning disabilities. And that's also short to PMLD. So if you hear that phrase, PMLD, it means profound multiple learning disabilities. And this piece is a multi-sensory and interactive experience for our audiences. Um, and each part of the show has a sensory element to explore. So Frozen Lights actors are trained to give each member of the audience the time that they need to explore the sensory elements making sure that the production and experience is unique to the individual. And that's going to be with us on the 15th and 16th of October. Thank you very much, Sean. To you, yeah, yeah. Um, 
as Helen mentioned, there are, there's lots of exciting things happening off stage as well as on stage at live. Uh, you may have noticed that um, there's some building work going on uh, uh, outside and on the quay side. And here to tell us a little bit more about how that's progressing uh, is our chief executive, Jim Byrne. Fantastic series of projects. Brilliant. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's um, so, uh, LiveWorks is the fourth in a series of, uh, of projects that we've been working on since really 2006. When we started in 2006, what we really wanted to do was just make a little bit more money to put into some more plays. It was really that simple. Um, ten years of austerity later, um, it's a very different picture, and um, uh, so what we're what we're doing with um, with our, all of our social enterprises is, is effectively replacing some of the public sector resources that we are losing, and that we will lose, and that we have lost. Um, LiveWorks is the fourth of those projects. It's an eleven million pound project. Um, it's a new office block on the front. Um, and it's a park and children's centre at the back. And the theory being that the properties that we bought and are developing will make money that we invest back into our mission um, so that we will be able to do more plays, support more artists, and quite particularly to develop the, the literacy and creative thinking of children and young people in the region. So. Hey, can you go into it? So this is some of the some of the shots of the building. It will be finished um, at the end of August. Um, and actually, the building on your left that you see here, as part of the whole courtyard, becomes our live tales project, our children's creative writing project, where we will, uh, once it's up and running by 2017, we'll probably have something like. Um, 10,000 young people go through that with their, with their creative writing um, every year. Um, it's, it, we will work with um, lots of volunteers to be able to deliver that project. So it becomes another very significant um, education project added to lives output. Um, these are some of the views from the top of the building. I've yet to go on the top of the building, but the stairs are in, so I'll be doing that this week. And then we have this, um, you've, got, you've got a copy of the landscaping as it's looking um, on your table. Just gives you a bit of a sense of what we're trying to do is beautiful sit sitting out areas, um, play areas for children. Uh, there's an outdoor stage. We'll show movies and we'll do, um, we'll do plays on the stage. I mean, the summer festival that Rachel talked about. Um, will certainly happen out there. There'll be a lot of it happening out there next year. So, with a bit of luck and a fair wind, it will be finished um, by the beginning of September. We will, uh, you can again see the outdoor stage here and the children's writing centre. Um, construction is a, it's just a few weeks late at the moment, but we, are, we, we should get it back in September. It should be all finished in September. And we'll roll out live tales um, from January, we'll do some pilots through the autumn, but from January the programme will really start to motor. And um, uh, the team have some fantastic ideas about what to do um, in the courtyard in terms of programming. Um, and I think that leads us on to Farm Palaces, Jess. Yes, yeah, well the first uh, project, the first opportunity in a sense uh, for us to make use of that space uh, will be in September and October, and we're really keen to be part of uh, a nationwide uh, network of arts opportunities which is known as the Fun Palaces, uh, which uh, the first year was last year. It's, it was um, a weekend of arts and science um, entertainment and activities that were commemorating the 100th ber uh, birthday, as it was last year, of Joan Littlewood. Uh, and so it's the first weekend in October, the 3rd and 4th of October, and here we have a little clip, I think, of what last year looked like. We wanted to make things that were free, local, innovative, transformative and engaging, and we had done all five of those to the power of 138.
They opened the gates and in they came. They never stopped. Hundreds and hundreds of people. I never ever seen before we'll have the astronomical society coming in for a uh, talk about uh, the sky. Our choir have baked cakes and we've got a fundraiser for the choir from the cakes that they will make. Wrapping. Uh, Tom workshop people teach the basics of BSL, uh, which is sign and communication language. There was uh, a food fight. Yeah, they had pots made, the drawing competitions for children. Um, and it was just so warm and well for me. The scientist area, and uh, there's all the chemicals and everything, and the bones and burners, and the acids and all that's quite interesting. Coming back this year on the 3rd and 4th of October, we've got a really exciting new space uh, that we don't really know the potential of yet. And so we're putting a call out to anybody who wants to come and uh, provide some uh, entertainment or activity in the space on that weekend. Uh, all the details are in the brochure and we're looking forward to engaging with new people and making the most of our brand new exciting spaces. And I think that is the conclusion of today. Thank you very much for coming, and we hope to see you at some or all of those activities in the autumn. Thank you very much. Thank you.